So good afternoon. Thank you. All right. You're looking at the stunning Himalayas, spanning almost 3,000 kilometers in between the border of Tibet and India. And I think you'll agree that looking at this image, this movie, they look quite majestical, quite calm, beautiful place to be. But the story of the formation of the Himalayas is actually one of intense energy. Uh, and that energy is associated with the collision of two of Earth's tectonic plates. So we're going to talk a little bit about plate tectonics. So in geological time, which is basically time sped up, it's like the equivalent of two huge land masses slamming into one another at speed. At other places on Earth, those land masses are getting ripped to pieces. So it's a violent and unstoppable shift that's happening all the time within our Earth, tearing the fabric to pieces, but it's been played out in apparent slow motion. As a result, our day-to-day -day observations of plate tectonics is really imperceptible change, not much to see, but then interspersed with violent and very dramatic events, like a, an earthquake or a volcano, for example. And it's my contention that the past 18 months have seen the tectonic plates of our industry collide together. Large seismic forces have altered our environment, altered our industry, to a point that it'll never go back to how it was before. And what's more, these changes, they aren't even over. I expect we'll see a series of aftershocks that will further drive and accelerate change in our industry. These will be violent jolts like the ones we've recently seen in the UK around petrol shortages, for example. My name is Ian Charles, I'm the Regional Managing Director at AWIN. And I'd like to share with you today my view on how three of these main aftershocks are going to play out. Now, individually, these aftershocks will create opportunities for organizations that are nimble and open to change. Collectively, they're going to have a much more profound and fundamental impact. I see them going to, that they will transform affiliate marketing from a vertical, if you like, within your organization, a vertical silo, to a horizontal, a fundamental underpinning of performance marketing. Now, you might think I'm getting a bit carried away. The opportunity to speak to you all today in person versus uh, behind, behind my screen. So let's, let's look at some real data. Look, let's look at some research. COVID and the resulting lockdowns have had a profound impact on all of us. I think we can, um, we can agree on that. But patterns are emerging now, how those sort of individual experiences that we've had are now being manifest in, in collective behavior. This YouGov survey um, in a report from Global Future reveals that over three quarters of the people surveyed said that they're planning to make a very significant change in their lives as a result of lockdown. So whether it's the long periods of isolation that we've had to endure, um, or maybe the consequences of seeing the very distressing images that have um, unfortunately been on our TV screens, both nationally and globally, associated with the pandemic, I think it's fair to say that we've certainly had to face our own mortality and we've had to really consider how we spend our time and what's important to us. This has caused some fairly radical rethinking from the jobs that we have, the places that we live, and even the people that we choose to live with. Fortunately, it's not all bad news. The pandas are sticking together. When lockdown came, we couldn't go to the zoos, and these pandas who they've been trying to mate for 10 years, they, they finally got it together. So uh, not, not all bad news. So the research that's carried out by our Global Futures is a survey. It's asking people what you think you might do in the future. Okay, so it's saying, might you change your job in two years? Might you move 
And, and we're not actually, what we're starting to see now is evidence of some of this actually uh, playing out. So the great resignation, as it's termed in the US, where people have, um, have quit their jobs in unusually large numbers is now making its way uh, over here. Uh, and the Office for National Statistics recently published some data that shows that job vacancies in the UK are really at an all-time high. Uh, so between June and August this year, they reached over a million for the first time since records began. So this is fueled, really, I guess, by rapid economic growth that we've seen, combined with the flexibility that many white-collar workers now enjoy in terms of being able to work remotely. Um, this is really accelerating the number of um, moves that we're seeing in the job market. But these changes are also happening in the housing market. Um, so people are choosing to move out of our city centers into suburban areas. Um, a guy I was talking to in the Green Room earlier on was on just the same thing. Um, and this is a research by Vodafone and Kantar that suggests that 56% of city dwellers are seriously considering moving out of the city centers uh, and into the greenery of, the, of England's fine countryside. Um, Nationwide have also reported that house prices across the UK are up 13% year to date, whereas in London that's only 7%. Uh, we're also seeing rental prices in London uh, f flat or declining in some areas against the backdrop of very high rental increases outside. And this is called the donut effect, where the center is left empty, um, but I guess all the cream and the sugar is on the outside. But no industry saw quite as much of a change and a transformation and a shift as our own industry, e-commerce. Uh, again, this is looking at uh, ONS data. And the UK was, has long been seen as a pioneering nation when it comes to e-commerce uh, and very high adoption rates, very advanced in terms of consumers' use of e-commerce. Um, but this has been given a massive turbo boost, a massive kick uh, through the pandemic. Um, and it was at the end of 2020 that we saw the share of sales made online um, hit 30%. Uh, and just by way of context, it took us over six years to get from 10 to 20 percent. So very, very significant growth. And advertisers have clearly followed consumers. Um, so more and more money is being spent now in terms of digital marketing, and ad spend has continued to take market share from other channels. And in fact, online was the only space that saw growth during the COVID period. So things are changing very significantly at a macro level. I hopefully I've been able to, um, I mean, hopefully you knew that already, but hopefully you've been able to be convinced by some of the research and the data that's out there. Um, but what about our own industry? What about our own sector? So I want to touch on three areas that I think are going to see um, the most radical change and will really transform the digital ad, ad industry. Uh, the first of these, it relates to a very intense battle that I think we'll see play out over ownership of customers and ownership of customer journeys. Uh, lots of big businesses with, with a lot at stake. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, second is around digital, digital incomes. Um, and I think we're seeing now the dawn of a new kind of way of funding um, content online. So I'm talking about a patronage model, moving away from a traditional ad-based model. Uh, and the third of these uh, aftershocks, if you like, is the complete disillusion, uh, not disillusion, the removal, I guess, of the silos that exist between marketing functions as we move truly into an omnichannel uh, world. So let's look at each of these in turn. Uh, and I want to start with the intensification of the battle to own the customer. So the pandemic has profoundly affected the notion of brand loyalty. And, and you know, as consumers, maybe you have experienced this yourselves, we've been forced into a, a mode of experimentation. Um, and people feel much more comfortable shopping with different brands, brands they haven't engaged with before, and, and also trying out new ways of, of purchasing. And, and some of this behavior has been forced, but I think probably because of the extent and the duration of the lockdowns, this behavior has become habitual. Uh, and so looking at this research, 75% you know, of people intend, intend to continue with this new way, um, whether that's switching and changing brands or, or, or maybe people who'd shopped online for the first time. So 
you know, if we're thinking that what's happened in the past 18 months is just a, a, a blip and we're going to reset, that is completely not what the data shows. The data shows that the behaviors and these sort of characteristics that we've, that we've seen are here to stay. So the rise of social commerce and the big tech platforms has really come um, at, a, at a perfect time for them. And their, their intentions here are very clear, which is to own as much of the customer journey, the customer experience as is uh, technically possible. You know, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Google, YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter, they've all developed recently um, the ability for consumers to, to make a purchase, to transact within their platforms. Um, and for brands, it's really compelling. You know, the, 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 the scale of which you can engage with millions, billions of people online and, and host their entire customer experience is a very compelling proposition for a brand. Um, but there are some significant drawbacks as well, which is around you know, the lack of control that you have over the brand experience, uh, limits on how much you can personalize your offer, uh, and also the data that you get access to um, post-sale, you know, how much data can you get, how granular is that, and how does that actually allow you to drive your own uh, campaigns and initiatives. So kind of moving back against that, we're seeing the rise of, of, of D2C. Uh, and this is both big brands and small brands who themselves see the appeal in wanting to, to own the customer and own as much of that journey as possible. Uh, it gives the opportunity for, for more personalized experience, for longer-term engagement and longer-term customer value. Uh, and Nike is a great example here, who I think now see about 40% of their sales uh, coming direct. So this sort of tug of war, if you like, this tension between advertisers and social platforms over where the transaction actually takes place, I think will be a defining characteristic of the industry of the coming years. Um, from an affiliate point of view, I think we're really well placed uh, to benefit from both sides of that equation. Uh, within, the, within affiliate, within AWIN particularly, you know, we really sort of hone in on this idea of um, outsourcing innovation. And what do we mean by that? It means that brands can rely on AWIN's technology, on our master tags and our security to be able to trial and error, to innovate, to, to turn on new technology partners very, very quickly without the upfront costs that you would um, might otherwise experience um, and to do really cool innovative stuff at pace. Uh, and of course, being able to do this on a CPA model ensures that you, know, you can truly kind of outsource your innovation um, through the channel. So one of our first case studies I want to talk to you about today is actually Curry's. Um, Curry's were faced with a, I think what they would acknowledge was a non-ideal customer experience where for certain he um, handset purchases, you weren't given a charger. So, you know, customers were checking out, they were receiving their goods, and they found that it did, the device didn't come with a charger. So not a great customer experience. Um, and so they were able to use a, a smart overlay from Intently, uh, which was shown to a portion of the traffic, and, and the results were very, very strong. So people were able to add the charger that they needed for the new device that they were purchasing. Customers were happy, curries were happy, uh, and a really, really nice case study. Uh, next case study here, again, just on these thoughts of rapid innovation, rapid enablement of technology partners, uh, this time on a publisher site. So this is looking at uh, ShopStyle, uh, where we introduce Tipster, uh, and Tipster enable um, consumers to check out at the point of inspiration. So in this instance, it's on the publisher's domain, on the publisher's website. They can load their basket, they can check out. The key thing for the brand is they still get access to all of that customer data, so they can still use it for their, for their own purposes. It created a really nice, seamless shopping experience. Uh, and since launching, I think, back in January, uh, Tips has now become one of the um, uh, significant portion of, uh, of ShopStyle's revenues. So again, another nice case study there. So that's the first one. Moving into the second one, this is, um, I think, touching on this profound change that I see in how content gets um, rewarded or how content gets funded online. And I'll take you back a little in history to the high water, which was the Renaissance period. Um, and in these days, uh, probably the 
Uh, think about Michelangelo's fresco paintings of the Sistine Chapel. These were funded by very wealthy individuals. So, in other words, if you wanted content created, you need to be a wealthy individual and, and, you, would, and you would fund it. Uh, in this case, the wealthy individual was Pope Judas II. I'm sure you all knew that anyway. Um, the emergence of the advertising industry has, has, has changed that. So we've moved from a, an environment where a high concentration of wealthy individuals were able to fund content to a much more distributed environment uh, where this could be industrialized and businesses could uh, indirectly fund the content that they wanted via ad investment. But that model is also now facing an existential threat because consumers are increasingly opting out of viewing advertising, of viewing ads, um, whether that's through the use of ad blockers um, or through subscription models where that's all housed behind a paywall um, and an ad-free experience. It's, it's really clear to me that there is an appetite for seeing less ads, okay? So that model is being, is being challenged. Uh, and you can see it through companies like Patreon, Substack, Kickstarter, they are all democratizing this concept of patronage in a, in a digital world. Um, so it allows us as individuals to directly fund the content creators that we love. You know, if they, uh, we really like a YouTube channel, then, we, we, then you, know, you can pay through Patreon, for example. Um, and many, many, many um, platforms are now incorporating this concept directly into, into, into their own platforms. So uh, Twitter, uh, recently introduced a tipping solution, Clubhouse introduced a similar one, uh, and YouTube have several tools, which are in, uh, a new one called Super Thanks. Uh, and then, of course, I suppose we have the OnlyFans phenomena, but I'm, I'm not going to go there today. So, big social platforms are clearly recognizing that content creators are a USP, and they're trying to finance their efforts and um, I think TikTok uh, has made, made headlines with its creator fund, which um, the rumors are true will be a billion by the end of 2023. Snap is paying a million dollars a day for content um, for uh, those people who, who create content that is most liked and most engaged on the platform. YouTube has its own fund, uh, and even LinkedIn is getting in on the act with, I think, a $20 million fund for the most influential content creators on the platform. So for me, these uh, new forms of monetization are a really clear indication that traditional advertising just isn't working. <clears throat> so, another case study. I want to talk to you about Marks and Spencers. So M&S um, wanted to create more content, uh, engage more with a younger demographic, um, um, but didn't have the resources to do it in, internally. Uh, and so they came to Avon and said, how can you help us with this? And we created a brand new role, uh, a dedicated influencer strategist role, and uh, they worked with the m and team to produce content that appealed to this younger uh, audience. And uh, the results have been really, really phenomenal, both in terms of the actual content that was created, but the consequence of that content as well. Uh, and how Marks and Spencers now see the funding between the brand side, the PR side, the social and the affiliate side as all, as all intertwined. We're also seeing, I, I think for the first time, an increased awareness within consumers of what affiliate marketing is. I mean, I mean we probably all have the same dilemma when you're explaining to your family what you do, and they kind of don't really get it, and it's a bit of an awkward conversation. But um, consumers are now starting to understand what affiliate marketing is and how it works. And this comes from some uh, research that the IB, IAB have done in terms of uh, their real living study. Um, and it shows for the first time that there's evidence that people know that clicking on links results in the, the people who produce that content getting rewarded. Um, and I think that is a, is a really cool finding. Um, but it also, for me, it resonates on how the affiliate model relies on this kind of circular balance of trust. It's only really the most authentic content and services that, that ultimately get rewarded, uh, and consumers will only purchase through affiliates that they, uh, that they trust. And of course, the brands reward those affiliates with, with incremental, uh, who generate incrementally valuable sales. 
which is very different to traditional advertising, as you know. Um, so I would say, from a future and affiliate point of view, this is all about the customer journey. It's not detracting from the customer journey. It is the customer journey. Um, and so, you know, we're now seeing large media houses we get very, very serious about um, affiliate marketing. Uh, so in this case, it's Future, who uh, drove a billion dollars of sales in 2020 through e-commerce. And um, affiliate activity now accounts for 31% of their revenue. I mean, that's staggering. That's literally phenomenal. Uh, BuzzFeed is another great example. Um, in, their, uh, in their plans that they had for the, that were documented around their IPO, they, they, they made a very specific point about how influential and how important affiliate marketing was to their growth uh, aspirations. All right, so to conclude with my third aftershock, and this is possibly a slightly contentious one, maybe a popular one, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> But it's about the, market, the, the silos that exist within a traditional marketing organization uh, and, and the fact that I think they're going to have to dissolve uh, fundamentally. So if you think about it, these marketing silos that we have, they're, they're, they're artificial constructs. We have created these within our organizations to house specialization and to make it easier for us to do stuff because the real world is far too complex. The actual divisions that exist between, between social, PR, PPC, display, and affiliate, for me, they're a, they're a symptom of how quickly our um, industry has, has evolved. And as new ad models have come along, they've been bolted on to the department. And, and, and what we see, we see internal teams who are squabbling over budget. We see disagreement about attribution of, of, of sales. And as each department individually tries to demonstrate its value, somehow the consumer gets lost. Um, I want to use a bit of an analogy to explain my point here. The, the original uh, QWERTY keyboard it wasn't a QWERTY keyboard. The original keyboard actually had the keys laid out alphabetically. Um, but what they found was that people were very, very quick at typing in that way. And so the hammers on the typewriter would jam. And so they couldn't get their typing done. They had to pull the keys back and start all over again. So the QWERTY keyboard was invented to deliberately slow typists down by separating the keys that were most popularly pressed, if that makes sense. So it's an entirely artificial construct. And I think, like hammers on that, those original keyboards, we find ourselves getting jammed with marketing activity that isn't optimized for the customers. And as a user, as a consumer, I'm not thinking about which marketing channel I'm engaging with when I'm on the web. I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to do a bit of PPC now. Oh, I'm going to, you know, we're, we're, we're just doing stuff online. We're navigating our way through content and, and um, experiences that ultimately will drive us to a, to a sale. And Google call this the messy middle. As consumers, we don't see those divisions. Um, and I think just like those original typewriters, we need to come up with a better approach. Um, and for us at AWIN, that means multi-touch, multi-channel attribution. Um, so I'm aware, I mean, I joined AWIN four and a half years ago. I remember as I joined, uh, omni-channel was a hot topic then. So, and it's a hot topic now. So we're maybe a little bit tired of hearing it as a, as a buzz phrase. But I think it's only in recent times that the, sort of the technology and the appetite for change have come together to, 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 make this, to make this feasible. And I think the pandemic has further accelerated that shift. Uh, this comes from an IAB survey last year where um, improving measurement and attribution was second, second only to recovery from COVID in terms of business performance. Uh, from an AWIM perspective, we acquired SingleView last year. Um, we believe that multi-touch, multi-channel attribution is the direction in which marketing must move forward to remain effective. Uh, and we've had loads of clients that have adopted single view, uh, including Ted Baker. So Ted Baker used it to analyze uh, customer journeys, contribution of different affiliates. Uh, and they, I mean, they, they love the technology. One of the cool things that they found was that um, Marie Claire was driving a lot of uh, higher funnel activity that was completely blind to them. 
Um, and so using single view, they were able to revisit that and think about how they reward Marie Claire for all of these new, new sales and new customers that they were introducing to Ted Baker. So, I mean, hopefully you agree with me, but there's, there's, a, there's a desire to get this unified view of ad spend. Um, but the spanner in the works is the growing influence of, of, of these walled gardens and their platforms and their ability to provide uh, first party targeting. So I mean, you could use these ad platforms. They'll come with their own uh, attribution models that they will dictate to you. And, um, and often the reporting isn't the most, the most transparent when things go wrong, as they uh, sometimes do. So the, the industry is littered with these sort of case studies and examples of things going wrong and errors, whether it's in the method or the power dynamic. Um, but it's clear to me that the advertiser isn't actually at, this, at the center of this equation. It's these walled gardens. Um, and also, this isn't the reality. This is not where people are spending their time these days. If you look at how much time is spent on the open web behind these, uh, behind these wall gardens or platforms, it's, it's, only, uh, it's only increasing. So the affiliate channel does offer some respite here, but we have to slightly reorient how we think about the channel. And this is typically what we would see with, with affiliate as a, a vertical, um, but I don't think that's appropriate. I think going forward, we need to be thinking about affiliate and park and marketing as something that powers and underpins um, all of our different channels. It really should be seen as a horizontal rather than a vertical. And you know, I mean, affiliate activity is becoming more sophisticated, whether it's through uh, multi-touch attribution, whether it's through app tracking, uh, technologies like bounceless tracking that Awen have that remove the need for, for an ad uh, from an ad network, the, the use of cookie list voucher codes. I mean, it's becoming really, really sophisticated. And this means that the industry is becoming much more attractive, um, I believe, as a way of tracking and measuring and rewarding a very diverse um, array of activity in a unified manner. So we've run through some of the disruptive changes that I, um, that I think we're gonna ha are going to happen and that the pandemic has accelerated. But I wanted to finish by asking whether, whether these are aftershocks or whether there's actually something bigger that may be happening um, here. I mean, a quick, quick scan of the news recently. We've, got, we've been told that turkeys will be out of stock for Christmas. There's been a fuel crisis, um, chip shortages, meaning huge lead times for buying laptops and consumer electronics. You know, what, just what next? I mean, in the UK, we rely very heavily on a just-in-time just in supply chain, and I think that supply chain is now being shown to be heavily prone to these, these sorts of disruptions. Um, at AWIN, we really do pride ourselves on providing a, a very wide and diverse uh, set of partnership opportunities that can respond to unforeseen challenges like the ones that we've seen. Uh, and I wanted to close just with two examples of, which I think are super, super cool um, organizations that have responded really, really quickly. So the first of this is uh, TasteCard. I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with TasteCard as sort of um, card you take when you go out for a meal, tourist attractions, etc. Um, and of course, during COVID, all of these places that you'd have taken your taste card closed down. So, so what then for a business that, that built its model um, around that? So they actually used the affiliate channel um, to create a brand new benefits platform when with a few weeks of launching, uh, they had 35 brand partnerships signed up, all built around the concept of staying in. You know, these, are, these are organizations and brands that could bring things to your house rather than you requiring to go there. So they completely flipped their business model around. And it's been so successful that even now as things are starting to open up and the original sort of taste card can go back to what they used to do, they've kept this part of their, of their model. Uh, it's actually part of their long-term strategy. My second example also comes from lockdown, and um, I think it talks about how affiliates are helping to solve real-world consumer dilemmas as well. So if any gamers in the audience who may have struggled to get a PS5 because of scalping bots, um, we had a really cool affiliate who, who, who came in and tried to solve this problem, uh, and did solve this problem, certainly for a number of people. So it's called Hotstock. 
Um, and Hotstock is a, a real-time product tracker, so they are monitoring stock availability of thousands of fast-moving uh, popular products any given time, and you get a notification um, if any, if any um, online retailer has stock of that, of that item. So they were able to beat the bots, right? able to beat the bots and get there first, and, um, and, and millions, millions of sales were driven through Hotstock uh, by being able to, um, to, to get ahead of the bots and redirect consumers very, very quickly to, uh, to websites where they did have stock. So, in conclusion, we need to be prepared for more macro changes in our industry, um, more aftershocks as the, as the tectonic plates of our markets continue to adjust and to settle. Uh, and I think we need to expect and maybe even um, preempt some fundamental changes to the status quo. And that means being open to new ideas and being open to experimentation. Because I do believe there are considerable opportunities out there, whether you're a publisher, whether you're a brand, um, whether you're a tech partner. But you need to work with a marketing platform and a company that's as nimble and adaptive as you need to be, one that's able to uh, decode the future and anticipate these market changes, one that's supportive of all types of partners, from those who drive sales to those that optimize sales and ultimately those who eventually make those sales, uh, and one that is invested in the long-term health of the industry, and that one is AWIN. Thank you. <laughs>